have a purpose guys have a purpose in everything that you do so if you're going to work make it your purpose to either skive and get money for nothing or make it your purpose to do the best job that you can there and what you need to do when you get in a position of uh, power is to give other people a purpose hello and welcome to the McEwen bar Cod podcast my name is jamie today we have gregor and we have a special guest he's the number one author for police books he has got over four hundred thousand followers on quora and he's also got a massive following on medium and twitter so who could this guest be gregor so this is our dad unbelievably but we've got a couple of questions we want to learn a lot in this episode so dad can you give me a brief background to how you started your career in the police and how long you were there? Well, I kind of fell into the police by accident. Um, I was at university uh, doing maths, physics, computing and psychology uh, and I failed to the four exams. So I thought I'll take a year out and go back to university the next year. So I started doing little jobs around the place. Um, I had a, a window cleaning business. Um, as the weather turned into winter, it was getting rather cold, the fingers were freezing, and uh, I met one of my old school chums in the pub, a boy called Rab, and I asked him what he was up to. He says, oh, I'm joining the police. He says, how much did they get? About £100 a week. I went, oh, £100 a week? That's not bad. So I applied, and two weeks later I was standing on a parade square in uh, Tilly Allen, <laughs> and Rab didn't get in. <laughs> he blames me for taking his place. He actually joined the Metropolitan Police and worked down there for 10 years before he moved back up. But I don't think he's ever forgiven me. <laughs> um, but I enjoyed it for the day one. Um, the next year was the minor strike. We did a lot of overtime covering for um, the, the pits and things like that. And I made so much money and was enjoying myself so much that I decided not to go back to university. And I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do anyway. Uh, and I stayed there for 30 years. Well, that's um, quite interesting, obviously. Me and Gregor will know for 30 years it's been, uh, we've had our challenges with, obviously. I mean, we'll be in about 30 years. But, oh. but, no, but like the younger years of obviously dad being, having the shift work and stuff like that. And uh, how did you manage to deal with that, dad? And then also other question I've got for you is what advice would you give someone to starting in this career? Um, you know, if someone's looking to get into the police? Starting in the police, um, I would probably give the same advice uh, to anybody in any career. Um, my dad, who passed away last year, I asked him the same question, what advice would you give your 18-year-old self, dad? And he gave me a two-word answer. He said, stick in. Stick in, that was it. And I knew what he meant by stick in. Um, I would expand on it and I would say one show up show up for your family show up for your friends and remember nobody needs enemies so that would be my first tip in the police or any other career I think you should engineer it engineer your career make sure that you know what you want to do choose what you want to do and find out how to get there and it's important that uh, you're doing it for the right reasons and you're not just there particularly the police carrying a uniform. Can I, can, I, can I jump in? So you spoke to someone in a pub, obviously early in your career. Yeah. And now you're coming back to us being like, oh yeah, en- engineer it, make sure you know where you're going, yeah. what you want to do. Do you think it's hindsight or what's making you... I think probably I would have, very much hindsight, I think probably I would have uh, moved on to a different career if I'd known what I wanted to do, but I didn't. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was just happy doing what I was doing. Um, one thing I did do was I remain curious throughout my career. I was always interested in what was going on, how things worked, and not just about things in the police, but um, in people, uh, interested in who they were and how they got there. And uh, I think that's an important aspect of any career is being curious because as soon as you get something that you're interested in, you go down this rabbit hole, it's, it's fantastic. You never know what will come out of it. Does that make you, does that make it easier to learn and enjoy the job? Or is that Oh, absolutely, yes. In general? Uh, uh, curiosity is a, a, a wonderful thing. 
and um, you, you have to try and instill that in your children. I think I'll, you learn things as you go on in life. And one of the things that I've learned recently through being curious and doing writing and things like that is that babies are naturally curious. And when they start pointing at something or talking, that's then their cue to, to learn more. And so if they start pointing at a toy, you pick up that toy and instead of talking in a baby language, um, you tell them what it is and you tell them what colour it is and tell them what it does and they learn quicker as a result of that. If they learn that pointing at something means they get ignored, then they'll stop pointing. And it's the same throughout your life. If you're not curious, not interested, or somebody isn't interested in you enough to go and show you things, then you become less curious and less interested. Have you... So I echo that, and I feel like when you ask questions, like, you know, kids have loads of questions, but when I'm in my role at the moment, I'm asking questions, it's almost like you're at school feeling like, oh, is, is that a stupid question? Do, does, does it relate that back to asking more questions, or is it just being like, I don't have to ask questions, I'll find out, being curious, I'll find out in my own time? Or in the same situations, do you be like, I want to ask uh, about questions? I think, well, um, being curious is just an... Uh, as a human thing, mm -hmm. and uh, we should all we should be curious no matter what career you're in, because without curiosity you don't learn things, you don't get interested in things, and as, as soon as you lose interest in things, you die. You're not if you're not interested in doing anything or going anywhere or seeing people, you die. My mum was fantastically interested in us. She was fantastically interested in what we were up to. And, she always asked me whether I phoned or went down. She always asked, how's Callum and Gregor and Jamie getting on? She always asked what Joanna was up to, what time she finished work. And anything that was happening in their lives, she was curious and interested. And um, and you stop that, you stop living. So. Do you think that's a, um, like a, a key skill or attribute that you need for a career in police? No, I, th I think it's a key uh, human trait. Uh, that everybody requires and should should um, strive to achieve is to be interested in things and be curious about the world that we live in. If you were to obviously um, expand on that in terms of skills and attributes that you think actually are required for obviously being a police, you did it for 30 years, there's obviously skills and stuff you still have to have to get into it. As you said, there's Rab never got into it. What is there a particular reason why you never got into it? Is there something to actually say that reason why you did because you had a certain skills or something that was you were able to get into it? Well, let me just before about an interview in the day, um, he got he got back into Central Scotland Police um, later on after he joined the Met, um, and that happens. Some people have to go elsewhere sometimes. Or if you've only got three positions coming up, then uh, they they choose who they think might perform the role the best. So. I was lucky in that respect, I suppose. Um, but your, your original question was, um, what skills did why in the police? And one of the things, I would, another thing I would add to that is uh, do what you say you're going to do. And don't promise to do things if you have no intention of doing them. And that sometimes means saying no. And that can apply to any career as well. But if you say you're going to do something, go and do it and get it done by the time that you're going to get it done by. Now, a little tip for you is if somebody say asks you um, when you're going to get that report done, I'll tell them it's going to take twice as long as it actually is going to take you and then get it finished and handed to them in half the time. That makes you stand out. I get I get, I get where you come from, but sometimes I do feel in certain situations, you might feel like somebody asks you to do a job, but you're in an organisation where maybe other people can do the same job, but your manager or whoever's trusting you to do it, and then they come to you being like, I know this guy can get it done quickly. He's going to do a good job. And as soon as I get it back, I'm not going to need to do any revisions. And then you turn around and be like, yeah, that'll take me twice as long than what you think. And they go, oh, go take that long. I'll find something else. Does, you know, it could backfire. Well, you, you, it might backfire. What I'm saying to you is if you're going to do something, make sure you get it done. Right. Okay. Do what you're, you're doing. And then in that instance, um, the people who, and I did it myself, you give jobs to people, the busy people, because they're the ones that are getting the job done and things like that. And one of the things that um, I learned to say myself was, yeah, no problem, I can do that. What do you want me to stop doing? Because I've got all this and that and the next thing to do as well. Okay. 
So rather than um, saying, no, I can't do it because I've got this, you're saying, no, no problem. Which of these things are you going to take off me? Okay, interesting. So if you were to, if you were to go back and have a second chance at your career, what would you, would you do it again? Or would you, would you do anything differently? Um, I feel as if I, well, oh boy, yes. I would do things differently. Yes. You, you learn from hindsight. Is that a long you list? You learn from experience. <laughs> it's a, oh yeah, it's a long list. Yeah. Um, I would definitely have um, spent a lot more time um, learning. Uh, I would probably have uh, went back to uni, it was open university, and studied my, my spare time and followed through a lot of my interests that way. I would have learned to write and I would have written um, a lot more um, at an early stage. What I know now and what I'm doing now since I've retired is I've been writing books. Uh, I've been writing um, on Cora and on Medium and doing um, blogging basically and articles and things and I love the research process and um, what that's done for me is it's improved my writing greatly and that would have st stood me in so much good stead uh, as a cop and I think in any career it's not a disbarment to success because you just need to look at your uncle Kenny he's dyslexic Jamie you've struggled with letters and words and things like that but that's not a disbarment for you and in fact you look at Richard Branson one of the richest guys in the world he's dyslexic but he still keeps a notebook and writes things down he, he takes a note of things all the time you've got to have um, the, the thought processes there to do it but if you can write, then you can have a lot more success because what writing does is it clarifies your thinking. If you're writing something, um, you have to formulate an answer and put it down in a, a, a format that people can be understood by other people. And if you're doing that, then you're understanding it yourself. There's a, there's a thought going about or from what I've looked at is almost daily journaling your thoughts. In yes. the morning works yeah. like that way is that something that you know you talk about writing obviously you know the more you write the more you can build up skill you're more curious you are about it you look at other writers you learn from them and then you get better at it uh, and they look yeah is you know would you would you be like you're writing in the past or that, that you didn't do that you wish you did is that you wish you doing what you do now with research and stuff or is that just a case of literally i wish i just wrote anything like doesn't matter what it was, as long as I was writing, I think that would have that would have bettered me. Um, well, I always had an idea I was going to write a book from the very okay. day um, that I caught burglars, <laughs> the rugby club. <laughs> the um, my, my tutor at the time took me down to the rugby club, and we were we arrived there so quick after landing it off. We suspected the guys were still inside, and um, he said to me, "Right," he whispered in my ear, "When I pointed you back like a dog." And I thought, well, okay, that sounds a bit strange. And then he went up to the door and he was right, if you don't come out now, I'm going to send the dog in. And he pointed at me and I went, woof, woof, <laughs> and I gave my best Alsatian impression. <laughs> and this is how we caught the guys, because the two of them had been hiding on the roof. We would never have seen known they were there. They burst out laughing. <laughs> so we heard them on the roof and caught, them, caught our first two burnt um, housebreakers. So uh, I went home and I always thought, oh, this, is, this is a career at uh, you get so many interesting, funny, sad events, and it's it's a cornucopia of the world that you deal with, and um, you get sent to where all the problems are. So you come out with a lot of stories and things like that, and and I wish I'd started writing them down and um, not even publishing them, but doing a, having a better record of them at the start. And that's journaling. Um, it's a great thing for any career if you if you want to do that. But there's actually evidence that suggests that uh, daily journaling and handwriting it um, helps improve your thought processes. And even a gratitude journal, if you write down three things that you're grateful for every day, it makes you happier in the long run. There's actually scientific evidence that, that shows that. See, because there's the evidence there, you've done the research, does that make you go, I need to pick that up? Or are you just like, oh, it's a nice idea? So I, I, I like the idea and I'm doing that now with my own writing. Every day I'm researching things and doing and writing stuff down. And... So Dad, obviously when it came to your obviously 
tailing end of the years of the place you knew the 30 years were coming up how did you like mentally process for that sort of ending like how did you get yourself ready for the retirement and did you have a plan in mind was there anything in particular that you set set up or did, yeah. how, how did you go about that i always thought i would do the big thing um my intention was when i retired was to move on and uh, do something big start a business um go to sales and i was never ever sure what that was uh, which was probably one of the reasons i stayed on an extra couple of months because i could have retired on the 18th of december uh, 2013 and missed out working christmas and new year and things like that but i just wasn't sure what i wanted to do um so it was a couple of months later before i, I did retire and even then i still wasn't sure other than writing i always knew i wanted to uh, do police memoirs and by that time i'd collated quite a lot of stuff and it took me time to go work all through that um, i spent a lot of the spring and summer getting myself fit exercising um, and enjoying just taking that break from it, the break from, because uh, it's quite intense, the police. Um, it can be quite uh, stressful at times. Um, I retired as an inspector, so I was away from the front line mostly, um, and it was a, a, a lonelier position than it was when you worked with the guys. Um, and when you had a laugh in the shift and things like that. Did, um, you, did you prefer being closer to? Yeah, I think probably the best job I had was um, as a sergeant because uh, everybody likes to solve problems and if you got a job to do, you would go and solve one problem at a time. But as the sergeant, you would have 10, 12 people coming to you with their issues and what they've dealt with and looking for solutions. So you were solving their problems for them and it was quick turnover, a highly satisfying at work. Um, as an inspector, you had to have a kind of helicopter view and, uh, look to be slightly above um, everything that was happening. You didn't, you couldn't really get involved in the minutiae of the job. You had to keep your eyes and ears open for the big things that were going on to take charge and make sure things weren't missed. Uh, so ticking the boxes. You talked about this big. You know, you thought you were going to do the big thing. Yeah. And you've moved on to do right a lot of books. Well, what, what happened was I, I, I got myself a job in the student support centre um, and I was making good money at that, uh, but it was part time. So I went up to Aberdeen for a weekend and I had a night suit with your brother when he was at university there and made some money during the day. And when I came back, I fell ill. Uh, doctors misdiagnosed my illness as sciatica. It turns out it was an abscess that had burst and I ended up in the hospital, as you know, 10 days in a coma. And uh, it took, I was six weeks in the hospital, and it took me a year and a half again to get back fit again. But during that time, I had a, um, a realisation that um, life isn't just about doing the big thing and making money. And uh, So was the big thing to you making money? It, it was making a success of something in that, uh, and I suppose seeing my older brother with um, his business and how well he'd done, there was a bit of jealousy there and things like that, but I came to the conclusion that your happiness and your health is far more important. You can't, your uncle Kenneth uh, and um, other people of his ilk suffer from, have all the trappings of wealth. They've got the nice car, they've got the nice boat, they've got the two houses, they've got the house in the loch and they can go to the big holidays and all that, but they've also got the obesity, the stress, the worry that goes with it. The, um, you know, Uncle Kenny suffers through seizures and I'm absolutely certain that that's down to the fact that he works 24-7 and he has to always be doing the deal and things and uh, he hasn't got that capacity to really relax and to some of his friends now, I think, sometimes. Um, so. It's important to um, get life into perspective in that respect. Do you think have a laugh. Have a, have a laugh at yourself. Have a laugh with others and don't have a laugh at others. Okay. Would you say the big thing, because I'm obviously surprised at you saying that, but uh, maybe like the big thing, and to me is what I see it as well um, with you, is you, you've got freedom of time to do what you want. Yeah. And you've got, the big thing for you, I guess, is 
on a Saturday, you come and play golf with us. Uh, you know, you're going to have a good time. Yeah, that's uh, the big thing, Gregor. Yeah, playing golf with you. As long as it involves <laughs> me, I'm happy. <laughs> I love um, that. I, I, honestly, I love your company. I love... I, I, it's a win-win for me to go because um, I go there and I beat you most weekends and um, that's great. But when you do get one over me and you do win, <laughs> then you're my boys and I'm chuffing you. So. Well, you're a bit of a bandit. So. <laughs> right, so, um, you know, what you're doing right now, do you expect to be doing that for the rest of your life? Um, I expect to be doing something. One of the things I would say to you is uh, I didn't have a chain, I didn't retire. I had a change of career and um, you can slow down it was Tom Hanks who went to a, his neurologist and he saw the diplomas on the wall and he said to him look you've got all the qualifications here um, what should I do to have a long life and the neurologist who'd studied loads and seen loads of people come through his office and knew the, this he said never retire so you can slow down you can um, take it easy take things easier not do as much but never retire, always be doing something. And I've taken that on board. Um, I do not see myself stopping writing. Um, if I do stop writing, it will be to do something else. It will be because I've got another interest or whatever. Yeah. Would you say there's a stigma then around that, and especially I think in the UK, that this idea of retirement has to be this do-nothing state of mind? Um, who cares what other people think? I don't. I, if people want to look at me and think, oh, you retire, I'm doing nothing, then that's up to themselves. They've absolutely no idea what I'm doing. No, I no. do look at other people who are retired. Yeah. Um, and I, mean. uh, I suppose there's an element of me has a little bit of stigma about the fact that they're doing nothing, that they're wasting away, that they're... Um, some, no. Um, a lot of people go on and leave the police and because we're relatively young, um, they go into other jobs and it's a little driving job here or uh, whatever. And, you know, that's perfectly fine as long as they're happy doing that. Um, but it wasn't for me. Okay. So, I, I like the fact that at any stage I can stop what I'm doing. I can go and have a round of golf. Not that I do very much. I, I like the fact I can get up and uh, go and help my grand and papa when they were living and when they suffered the COVID and things like that. We could have good stroke everything and uh, going with not have to worry about that uh, so you know it has massive advantages uh, working for yourself and not being under the clock do you, do you feel that it's so like there's an aspect of like from going back to even a little bit of last week's like of Rebecca's psychology and how people there's like there's the class thing do you think that what you've had and experience you've had is a little bit to do with obviously the class that was being brought up and obviously Papa being um, you know, we've not, not had a bit of money to be able to do things that we want to do. Golf, we talk about playing golf. Not everyone can play golf. You know, we're doing things that not everyone in the world can do. Would you say that you feel a bit that um, lucky to be in the state that we are? Because there's people who sometimes just actually have to go to drive in a taxi and never see it stopping. You know, there's people that have to stack a shelf because they can't get in to do the next things. And that's all to do with like a class issue. Would you see that we're, we've been you've been lucky in the sense of what you've the career you've had and what you've been able to do now. Is that something you would? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I want to I want to add to that because I I echo where Jamie's coming from. Like, um, obviously me and you, Jamie, been early in our careers. You earlier than me. There's you know you got that sense of pressure to be like I want to make um our our success ourselves financially successful so then you yeah. can retire and have like a comfortable retirement mm. but then at the same time you're like oh what do i need to do to get there and then you know you try and work out information you know we're talking about you know messing our day it's like where's your pension pots and i was like well yeah let's let's dive into it a bit let's have a discussion so yeah well, the- what i would say to you guys is you, you actually when you're young you that's when you need to take your chances um it's far far easier for you and your position that you're in and to go and do something else or have a side hustle or um, delve into some, dip your foot into things that um, you wouldn't normally do because um, you, you, you've no responsibilities. You haven't got kids. You haven't got a dog to look after. Um, you've both got flats now, but you're just rented. So, you know, there's, there's so much you can do. Um, 
How, well, right, yeah. I get that. How how did it make you feel walking out that office for the last time? Obviously, you, you you know it wasn't. It's never really the last time. You know, you've got friends in the police still and all this. But there must have been a day when you're like, "That's your last day." How did yeah. you feel? Um, I had mixed emotions. Obviously, yeah, okay. I had mixed emotions. Um, sorry, there was one other thing I was going to add to the last bit, and that's about privation. Um, if you look at um, immigrants that come into countries, they have nothing, they, and yet there's so many of them work hard and get there and build themselves up and build businesses and make millions, and then uh, the next generation continues it. But third generation on, when they've got all that, they, they haven't been deprived of things. Uh, they work less hard. It's that things come easier to them, and that's one thing I worry about. You guys is that we've supported you. You've had everything handed to you on a plate. You've got your golf lessons. You got your car. You got things that anything that you needed without having to worry about them. And sometimes it takes a little bit of privation, uh, you know, just to appreciate. Um, what it is that you need to do to get where you're going. And um, that's why sometimes the older child in my family and a lot of other families do better because parents don't have the same, they give them the attention to start with, but they don't have the um, same amount of restraints and comforts that they've had uh, before. So. They have to go out on their own and do things. But when you get shown how to do something and you, you, you see how easy things are and all you need to do is this, then it becomes easy. So, you know, give yourself a, a well, wait a minute, what happens if this, well, I'm going to just try something new. I'm going to make access or work hard at this. And that's how I, I would have, um, even in the police, you know, I worked hard. But could I worked harder? Absolutely. Could I have been um, a better communicator? Yes, I could have learned to speak. I could have um, been more competent, absolutely. I could have studied more law and known um, more about police procedures and things like that at an earlier stage and actually worked harder at it. Um, yeah, you can always do better. Yeah. Okay, that's, uh, I think it's been really interesting to learn, obviously, about the police and everything. So what I think would be good to that is learn a little bit more, obviously, now you've, you, you did your 30 years, you've moved on, you had illness, we know you recovered. That was a tough period for I think everyone um then that happened, but now you're doing um other things. You're obviously doing your writing. Can you provide the audience obviously a lot of information about um what you've written, how many things you've written, and also what platforms you're currently on? Because obviously I introduced um Quora, um you're on Medium, I know you do a little bit of Twitter as well. Let the audience know a little bit about these platforms um and give a bit of insight. Yeah, sure. Um, well, first and foremost, it was my books. Uh, I wanted to get uh, capture my police career um, and the funny characters and the strange situations that found her in, um, and th that was my, my goal for starting to write. And so I did one as a cop, I did one as a sergeant, I did one as an inspector, um, and they got better as they went. I. Still, they're still not as good as I would like them, but I just went over um, my first one, uh, the really funny thing about being a cop. With what I've learned in the past few years about writing, I've managed to make it better. Um, I've certainly got rid of a lot more of the spelling and grammar to, you know, errors that um, you, know, you pick up as you as you go along uh, when you're at that writing. And, um, and, and I think it's quite a, quite a funny book. I had somebody on Twitter today actually say they just finished it and thought it was a laugh a minute from uh, start to finish, which is great. It's great feedback, but it also pays me. Um, this month I am seventy-two pounds from my books. Um, now that's mostly my police books. Um, I do. I have written um, lateral thinking books, quiz books, game books, and put them on. And any sales from them I give away to charity. It's not much. Um, last year there was. Three hundred and odd pound went to uh, good causes. Antibiotic research was sort of supported there, obviously because if it wasn't for antibiotics, I wouldn't be here. And uh, I, I, I've enjoyed that process, and I think it's great that uh, five years after publishing them, I'm still earning some money from them. Now it's not a lot of money, but it's still money, and uh, I, I like that aspect of it. Uh, went and I found Cora because what happens once you've 
sold, uh, given your family and friends a free book and sold to a couple of colleagues and things like that, is you drop off the, the radar. So you've got to promote yourself. So I joined Cora. It's a question answer site. People ask the questions. I put down funny answers, um, and I had a sticker above my name that uh, showed a, the books that Gregor had prepared um, and did the covers for. And it's a result of that that people buy it. They, they see me in the air, they think some of the answers are funny, and then they go and have a look at the books and they, and they buy it, and I make a couple of quid out of it. I still have to pay tax on that, and I have still have expenses and things like that to do, but um, uh, one of the things I do is I do travel writing. I wrote a travel book after it called If It Wasn't For The Midges, and when I research that, that becomes tax deductible, which is quite nice. Um, I built up a following in that. I did a, a space on Cora called Curious Minds because that's what I've got. I love reading things that are fascinating, uh, that are fulfilling and funny. And uh, I did one called Cop Stories, and there's cops around the world go to that site and read some of the stories there and put stuff on. I put some of my own stuff on there, uh, and that's good. Um, but there's a lot of dribble in Cora as well. There's a lot of um, rubbish goes on to it. It's not all good. And I like the recent pretty things. Um, and when I found Medium, and me, it wasn't until I, I found Medium nearly a year and a half ago that I started to realise how bad my writing was and how much I could improve. And because they have a, a lot of people, a lot of writers on there who give a lot of writing advice, I've picked up a great deal about it. Uh, and I've learned from that. And it's my biggest earner now. I get more money from Medium than I do from uh, any other site. I'm on Vocal. I just joined that a month ago. Uh, I have put up, uh, re repurposed some of my other writing and put it on there. Uh, but I don't get the same good vibes from it as I do from Medium. Um, there are other sites that you can write on. Um, I might try them, I might not. But, um, it's time factor. It's getting the time to do all these things. And I do everything myself. I do all the promotion myself. There's nobody helps me out. Um, I have. Uh, I don't get any support from uh, anybody other than Gregor, who does the covers from my books. And when you guys read some of my stuff on Medium and give me some claps or so everything else, I do myself. How many claps did you get today, Dan? I got fifty from you, Jamie. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, no, it's, it's really interesting to obviously see that. That you know? was a story about him. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, it's really interesting to obviously learn about the transition from police to basically writing, becoming an author. It's not something that I don't think any of us would have thought would have happened, but obviously I remember being younger, I don't know if you remember as well, Dad writing the wee articles about us and he's You'd always have you'd always have an art, uh, word document open with like oh Jamie did this today or Callum did this and Gary did this, um, yeah. and I've always got a memory of that of you sitting in the office doing writing these things up. So, um, yeah, the side books. Of and Gregor, well, think about the financial benefit that we're gonna have for years to come. So we're gonna have this for you know Dad pass away. We'll keep writing his you know his books. We will just keep going and we'll. <laughs> we'll <make laughs> it's a bit morbid, Jimmy, but we'll take it. I mean, I can't wait for that seventy quid a month coming in. Oh no way! Eh? Like, that's gonna think. Think about that. That's that will build up the deposit on a house, Gregor. <laughs> um, I would just like to say, where can we, where can our listeners buy your books? Um, they're all on Amazon. You can uh, buy them uh, through the Kindle app, which is uh, they're nice and cheap and definitely worth the money. Uh, and I'll get seventy two pence uh, less tax from that. And uh, you can buy the books to order in paperback on Amazon uh, in the US and the UK and uh, I think Australia as well, uh, Canada, um, wherever you are. And uh, you just need to Google Malky McCune on there and you'll find them. Um, Amazing. So, do you, have any, do you need another cover soon? Just so I can uh, plan that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little bit off that. I'm, I'm, okay. There's a lot of effort going into medium at the moment. Right. I think um, what we'll do, Gregor, is we'll, we'll have the links down um, in the description. So if you want to go and buy one of our dad's books, um, we'll have a link to his Amazon account. So you can actually go and see and buy his books. 
Um, obviously, please do. Um, yeah, let's, give, let's... Give, give, give us some more inheritance for when we when we get that. Well, so a lot of it's going to charity work, so there's there is a good side to it as well. And I would just like to say, is there anything that we've we've learned a lot about you, your your career, what we should do in a career, then your later career, um, not retirement, as you pointed out, you never retired, and have we missed something that you would like to discuss? Um, I would probably like to say, have a purpose, guys. Have a purpose in everything that you do. So if you're going to work, make it your purpose to either skive and get money for nothing, or make it your purpose to do the best job that you can there. And what you need to do when you get in a position of uh, power is to give other people a purpose. I remember um, a superintendent of mine called us round the table and we got this project to do. It was about half a dozen of us. And we got this project to do and everybody was looking at each other thinking, this project's a complete and utter waste of time. And the superintendent sat there and he said, I know what you'll be thinking. You'll be thinking that this project is a complete and utter waste of time and nobody will read it. But what I want to happen here is for us to make sure that if anybody does read that finished product, that we have the best project completed that we can possibly do and that will be the most useful piece of advice in there for that person if he actually does read it. And that all gave us a purpose. We actually gave us a boost when we walked out of there. And I remember that from for uh, it used to come up when I went to a locus of a crime and we needed to guard the locus or whatever. I wouldn't send a cop and said, you just stand there. I would tell them, look, this is an important job you've got. I need you to stand in the pouring rain and make sure that nobody comes in there and tampers with that evidence and, the, and ruin the case. And if any cops come in here and step over that line, you make sure you've got it in your notebook when they go in, who they are, what they touch, what they do and so on, because we need to record everything and make sure they're in. That, all he was doing was just standing in the rain. But when you give people a purpose and a reason for doing it, the why, it makes it all the more easier and they'll, and they'll work for you. Amazing. I think that is some gold dust advice. Jerry, um, I want to say, from my point of view, thanks for coming on. You are our second guest of 2022 and I really enjoyed having you on the podcast. And I'm sure we've got many more to come and you will be featuring again shortly, hopefully, <laughs> later on in the year. So stick around for that. Jamie, do you want to round up? Do you have any other closing remarks? No. Um, thank you, Dad, for coming on. Um, once again, it's always a pleasure to have a chat and learn a little bit more in detail about what's, what you've got advice for us and our guests. Um, I hope everyone takes a little bit away from this. Um, and we'll wait for next week and... Hopefully you can come along and listen to our next episode. So thank you, guys. Thank you for having me. Can I just uh, say that I'm your number one fan for the podcast and uh, wish you all the success with it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Bye.